Today's episode is sponsored by the RevOps experts at Fullcast. With me is their head of customer success, Tyler Simons. Hey, Tyler. Revenue efficiency, sales productivity are everything today. How does Fullcast's go-to-market planning platform help RevOps teams achieve these types of goals? Well, Fullcast lets you build better territories so that the right resources are always focused on the right opportunities. When reps are motivated and zeroed in on their targets, they'll be more successful and bring in more revenue. That sounds great. I do a lot of that planning in spreadsheets today and I'm pretty happy with my spreadsheets. How is Fullcast any better than that? You must get rid of the spreadsheets because (laughs) spreadsheets create lag and errors. With Fullcast, planning and updating happen automatically all in one place. Best of all, it automates all common headache-inducing planning activities like territory rebalancing, account hierarchies, routing, and more. So when you're faced with those go-to-market plan changes, which, you know what, they happen all the time, Fullcast has your back. All right, you got me convinced. Where do I learn more about Fullcast? Our website, fullcast.io. Hey everyone, welcome to Operations, the show where we look under the hood of companies in hypergrowth. My name is Sean Lane. The first company I ever worked at literally could not do business outside of the United States. A huge part of our business was processing credit cards, and we were simply not set up to do that anywhere else in the world. So it was quite literally foreign to me when I got to a different company and people started using terms like EMEA and APAC. You know when you're in a meeting and you just start Googling acronyms that you hear because you have no idea what they mean? That was me. Also, good luck spelling EMEA if you've never seen it written out before. For those of you that are Googling these terms like I did the first time I heard them, let me save you the trouble. EMEA, or EMEA, is a region of the world that stands for Europe, Middle East, and Africa. APAC is Asia Pacific. And the moment when a U.S.-based company decides to expand internationally, more specifically when they decide to open up local offices in those international regions, that's quite the investment. Everything about your business gets harder, more complicated. To help make the complex simple, though, for the rest of us, we're chatting today with someone who has gone through this exact expansion twice at two of the most well-revered brands in tech, LinkedIn and Gong. That someone is Shantanu Shekhar, head of EMEA customer sales and go-to-market operations at Gong. Currently based in Dublin, Shantanu has the world map for the rest of us to follow to a successful international expansion. In our conversation, we talk about choosing where to open your first international office. We explore the balance of finding your own unique international identity while also staying connected to HQ and why your barometer of success metrics might need to shift in the early days of your international business. To start though, I think it only makes sense to ask Shantanu what happens when you as a company first decide to expand internationally. If I think about in the tech world specifically, there's probably even a stage before you technically go internationally and have feet on the ground. And what I'm talking about is most tech companies, let's say, which are founded in the US, have started setting up a certain amount of business, um, you'd almost expect 10% of their revenue to come from customers who are already outside, outside the shores of, of the US at some point. And, and what I mean by that is if, if I think about companies that are truly global, and I'm talking about not just tech, but even if you go to some of the big FMCG companies, you think about where the, the consumer split, the businesses split is in the world, you would think of a global company as any company with 50% plus revenue outside of the US, even if the headquarters is in the United States of America. Now, as you think think about companies starting on that journey, and I mentioned, let's say 10% is more organic. I don't want to call it easy. It's more the, let's say the English speaking US-like markets. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about, say, Canada. I'm thinking about, and again, most most companies don't even count Canada as international. We're part of US plus Canada together. But even I'm talking about Australia, England, the UK essentially, and UK and Ireland. And that part is almost more organic and you start that journey. Even if I think about a timeline, probably in the first few years, I'll I'll go more tactically into what I've seen in a couple of companies that I've been in. Um, Now, LinkedIn obviously is a a big company now, but when I I joined about eight years ago, it was a much smaller uh, global company. 
We'd only been in international markets for about five years at that point. So if I, if I almost work backwards, the first five to six years, LinkedIn pretty much operated from the US, had customers in, in, in Europe and Asia and so on, but was pretty much a, a, a global entity sitting in, in the US. Similarly, if I think about more closer to home now, Gong, where I'm sitting in, we're a series F company. We actually went global and hired our first GM for EMEA or Europe, literally around the same time as we had our funding announcement, our last funding announcement. Mm. So it, again, that mm. took about five to six years. So, but there's no, there's no set formula for what that starting point is. Most tech, tech companies that I'm seeing are probably in the 30 to 50% range by the time they're established, but that's 10 to 15 years down the line. And then in the initial stages, they're more setting up. And I'm, and I'm just talking about revenue, but obviously everything follows, right? All your headcount, your setup. There's a bigger question about not only where you're getting your numbers from, but also how you are thinking. That's more mindset. Is your product truly mm-hmm. international? So mm-hmm. that's what I think. So I want to come back to all of those kind of ripple effects that happen after you make that decision. Before we do that, can you maybe set the stage a little bit for how far into the journey that you just described were LinkedIn or was mm-hmm. Gong when you kind of joined their international presences? Great, great. And probably go, go with LinkedIn first because that's probably been a story of a company which has almost been there, done that, while at Gong we're still in that process of okay. doing it. Um, so if I think about really scaling international, if I use that phrase. Um, and again, timeline is, it varies. I'll use my favorite phrase. It depends on both the company <laughs> and, the, and the market. But depending on the time when you start setting up, you first choose your international headquarters. Most US-based companies would first foray into Europe or as we call it, Europe, Middle East, Africa, or EMEA, and then potentially wave two or wave three would be Asia Pacific and then Latin America beyond that. So in LinkedIn's case, they actually uh, landed in London about five or six years after they'd taken off from, uh, from the US. And in terms of what that meant, you start by picking up one market. In fact, there was a survey I'd seen 75% of US-based tech companies go to either London, Dublin, or Amsterdam. Hmm. And there's a combination of there's some similarity. Again, we talked about English, but again, US English is very different from the, the Queen's English or the King's English, I should now say. Um, and similarly, there's, there's, there's a similarities, but there's also the profile of the actual talent in there. But also the third piece, which actually propelled both Dublin and Amsterdam beside London is literally tax. And that was historically the reason why you had that. But then if you think about wave one, you start, you set up your headquarters in one place. You then try and figure out how do you go bigger in other markets? And again, I mentioned the 10% easy at the beginning of our conversation, Sean. Really, the 10% of early adopters, you could be selling into them from the US, from London, from anywhere which, which works. But it's really how do you go from there to identifying are these enterprise companies which, which you're looking to get as customers? Do they want people to sell to them in their language? What does it mean in terms of regulations? So, so many different operational challenges that you have to then start figuring out okay, now I'm in London or Amsterdam or Dublin. Next, up next, do I go into Paris to start selling into France? Do I go into Germany? And where do I go into Germany as well? And depending on the product. So LinkedIn did that and we literally created almost, I would say, a hub and spoke model where London was initially, I would say, the European headquarters. And then, sorry, you created more hubs in Paris for France, uh, in Munich for Germany. You had Nordics, which is relatively, again, similar profile of more English um, literate uh, population in the sense versus some of the other European countries. Amsterdam, obviously I mentioned, and the, the Benelux area, which is both Netherlands, Belgium, and Luxembourg, again, creates a, a very good landing spot. So you start doing that and you start scaling from there. And then the second piece, obviously, that's let's say that's the first international landmark is headquarters. Second international landmark is going bigger within EMEA. Third, then you start looking at APAC. And APAC, again, most companies think of, are we going to Singapore? Are we going to Sydney? And then you start from there. So according to Sean Denu, you should be striving to hit about 10% of your revenue from international sources before you even begin to consider putting feet on the ground outside the US. Let's start with EMEA. There are a number of factors in deciding where to put that European office. According to Sean Denu, you want to look at language, talent, taxes. And in terms of the order of operations, once you've committed to that new office location, 
you immediately want to start scaling your presence in EMEA so you can position yourself to repeat that playbook again elsewhere in regions like APAC. But I'm getting ahead of myself. What exactly is in that EMEA expansion playbook? It's not as easy or as fast as the quick summary that I just gave. Just like starting a company from scratch, it's incredibly challenging to build a new international presence from scratch. After seeing this playbook once before at LinkedIn, Shantanu is living it right now at Gong. So what did they decide to tackle first? If I think about the EMEA presence for Gong right now, we only started exactly two years ago now. So Gong as a company is almost eight years old. And five to six years in, we, we had about 10% of our revenue almost already coming in from international markets. Um, and then we said, okay, you know what? Let's now find a spot. Again, similar to most companies, we looked at Dublin, we looked at London, we looked at a few others. And we literally hired then our first GM, I would say almost. And again, most companies look at this in a different model, which could be a VP of sales. It's someone who's got a more general manager skill set. And we then pretty much got her, um, I would say, given the responsibility of setting up a team. And the way Gong approached it was a combination of getting a landing team. So we had a few people who had been in different roles. You had a few sellers. You had somebody who had been in customer success. We had a few early people who had actually gone in and been there and done that in the US, so knew the recipe for success, essentially. And they came in and started with, uh, with our GM at the point. And in fact, the same survey, a few surveys I've seen have talked about this. I would say about 10% of initial landing teams or companies start with landing teams who they brought over mm. from the US and 90% of the employee base is pretty much hired locally. Almost to a T I've seen, it's the GM or the general manager or the regional head or the VP of sales is always someone you've hired who has local market knowledge, has been there, done that in a, in a different company. And then they set it up from there. So this um, is the stuff that I want to get into, right? Because mm -hmm. y you and I could do a whole separate episode just on like the decision to go and, and actually yes. set up that international office, right? All the mm -hmm. you know things you need to consider from a market perspective. But like, let's let's jump ahead and, and assume yep. that you've done a good job of making that decision and you've decided, okay, it's time for us to <clears throat> expand specifically into EMEA, right? Like, let's, right. let's, let's keep it simple yep. and, and yep. focus on one international market. Right. When you make that call, mm -hmm. you know, you started to allude to some of these, you know, staffing decisions that you need to make right. as you're making that expansion, right? And, and yep. that, that concept of 10% of kind of quote unquote landing teams right. coming over from the US and 90% higher locally is, is super interesting. I'm curious, like, how have you seen the dynamics play out as you think about companies that have staffed using maybe that 90 10 rule? Um, right. And why do people approach it that way? Got it. And again, and because Dublin is such a small tech world, I've seen quite a few other companies who've had people come yeah. in and, and set up. In fact, another great example I could think of is HubSpot. Um, in fact, it was, they had the same person. It's, um, he's now, I think, their SVP of, I forget what he does exactly at HubSpot now, but he came in, he set up EMEA, and then he, went in, he moved to Sydney or Singapore and set up their APAC office as well. So he's mm -hmm. been in both, both worlds for five years. Um, so I think there's, I think what you just said about the landing team, I would say the, the main, there are two parts of it, right? There is what, I, what we might call institutional knowledge. And you just mm -hmm. bring in very simple things like, what's our product market fit? What are our core elements or foundational pieces that are required to succeed? You match that entire institutional knowledge and, and what's worked, what's not worked in the past as the company was going through almost, I would say, the initial startup phase, because the moment you start creating those international teams, you're essentially creating startups within the startup, right? And the second piece, if I think about institutional knowledge is one piece, the second piece, which is just as important, is how does that fit into more of the actual local market itself and what's required to succeed there? And there's some table stakes pieces, right? So you need to understand what does, what does product need to be? For instance, if you're if you're opening in if you're trying to sell to Germany now, I keep talking about the ten percent which are easier, and it's the next next ten to twenty which are tougher because you're trying to get people who are used to buying and transacting in their language, who are used to really doing business in their own language but not English, who are used to customer success teams, support teams, product teams, talking to them in their language. So how do you start creating that 
feeling of being a truly international player. Mm-hmm. And as, as you're building towards that, because nobody's going to start being a fully international company, even LinkedIn at how many years has it been now? Almost 20 years old. Is not, it might not feel the same in the US versus, say, in Italy. Mm-hmm. Um, so how do you start creating that crawl, walk, run approach to identify these are the pieces of table stakes? And I'll take one example here. Um, if you hire someone, let's say, in, um, in France, you're going into France, you're trying to build it. They will give you an idea of, hey, when we think about hiring for our team, we have a plan for the year. You need to figure out who you hire, but you also have certain regulatory um, pieces to actually toe the line to. For instance, you might get someone in after six months, they are your employee until pretty much perpetuity, right? So you need to understand (laughs) how that works. And uh, and again, American companies might not be used to because a lot of American companies are used to being being in in a contract where it's a lot less permanent. So those are elements which the mix of the landing team and the mix of Having some local knowledge it really works well, and, and that blend helps teams succeed, in my, in my experience. I think this team blend is so important to making that first international office work. Shantanu is giving us the formula to follow. 10% of employees are landing teams from your North American offices, while 90% are locals. And the leader of that new office should definitely be someone local as well. Someone who understands the local customer base, has an extensive network in region, and can also attract high caliber local talent. There's no denying the advantages of that 90% of the team being local. But I also want to further explore the 10% landing team that we're talking about and how critical it is to pick the right people for that group. Sure, they're going to have institutional knowledge about your product, about your positioning, and Hopefully, they have some good reps and sets already in successfully selling or servicing your product. But I'd argue that the institutional knowledge they have about your company's culture is actually their greatest asset. They should be the culture carriers for the company who can set the tone for the standards of the new team. At Drift, before we even decided to expand internationally, we first chose to expand from Boston to San Francisco. And when we did that, we sent one of our Boston AEs to live in San Francisco to help open that office and help ramp up our new West Coast colleagues for the first six months that that office was open. And that was so successful that we later repeated that playbook when we eventually did expand to Europe. I want to be careful here. Setting the tone for the team doesn't mean setting the identity of the team. In fact, I think it's important for the international offices to have their own identity distinct from their HQ colleagues. Here's Shantanu on what those 10% landing team members can offer. There's business. There's actually the culture piece. And to me, third, there's almost always the the connection. And I'll come to what I mean by connection as well. So business we talked about at length. Culture, I think, is spot on. Um, Pretty much every company, and I was trying to get there when I talk about the startup within a startup. If you think about every company which succeeded, you mentioned drift from Boston to the rest of the US, there's probably a unspoken agreement or operating principle which everybody adhered to, which eventually at some point I'm sure got codified as your company's culture and values. It's very different to have a few words in a wall versus actually living them. And that's something I've experienced again. And, and some of the folks who we had on a landing team, a combination of a few AEs, there was an SDR who, who actually I, I got a chance to know really well while, while she was here as well. They really come in and bring in, this is how we, this is what we do at Gong versus this is what we don't do. And this is how we do it. And just really building that piece. And to me, that's why the third part of that connection is also very important, which is Mm -hmm. you almost then have that connection back with folks in the organization who've been there for a long time and who know how things work, but also really it's, it's those, it's those unspoken, unspoken rules that you don't do and do or don't, don't break. And that's been, I think, a huge, huge benefit of having someone from there. I would imagine, too, that there's a balance to that, right? Where you, if you're, you know, one of the locals who Mm -hmm. is hired into that, like, there's also probably, like, you want that connection, but you also want to be Gong Dublin, right? Like, you want to have a little bit of your own unique identity, which I think is really hard 
for both the folks that are in the States as well as the folks that are in that local market to kind of find that balance? Do you feel that tension a little bit when you've been in these different offices? So, and and maybe I think I'll, I'll probably be biased because I'm in Ireland and I've seen this both, both play in, in, in both the companies and a couple of others that I've been as well. I think you almost have to have a mindset of if when you are not the global or corporate headquarters, you almost have a mindset of being, let's make sure when we have corporate guests coming over, let's make sure they get an, like our, our chief revenue officer is actually coming next week and I was setting up his agenda on what he's going to do when he's here. And you literally start thinking about how do you ensure that what will we be rem- remembered for is really, really mm. clear. And and we we actually spent some time on this about a year and a half ago when when we were just new in, in the company. We literally spent some time, what do we want to be known for globally within the company? And I would say without a without a shadow of a doubt, that entire focus on is is it gonna be fun? Are we gonna be people who take things seriously or sorry, take work seriously but not ourselves? How do we build that entire I would say uh, framework around which we operate so that when you have visitors coming over, you have the connection, you build that ex- brand for yourselves. But second, also when you're actually engaging and thinking about the next wave of expansion, we keep talking about international being an important part of the company's growth story. How do you ensure there's credibility in what you're building? You talked about being mm-hmm. being local or being Dublin first as well in some ways. How do you really build credibility that the global team will then have confidence Yes, I trust you, Sean, to go in and now go from Dublin to Paris to Germany to to Sydney, and that yeah. cre- that mix of both credibility and the brand of having uh, brought an additional or and yes and to the culture is very very important. I think these are really important things for folks that might be in the the HQ country to hear mm-hmm. and and have an appreciation for because yes. clearly it's a point of pride for you and your team and 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 yes. how your your country region is perceived but it's also you know to your to use your language of startup within a startup it's a lot of extra work right like, like you guys are doing the job yes. of running the business over there and you're kind of crafting this identity and 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 holding that up and so I think it's important for folks to kind of have that appreciation for that that added layer that comes with starting starting an international office, so so I think that'll be really important for people to take away. That's that's a great point, Sean. I keep, I keep joking that half of my job is even being just an events manager because <laughs> <laughs> I mentioned the agenda for any any like we literally have a running list of who's visiting every month from and and I think it's it's important to your point of giving people that confidence about not only invest having invested in the right people because. It is a major investment, right? Most companies which are investing to go global, we talked about timelines. You are investing in something which will probably only bear fruit about three to five years down the line. The first couple of years are going to be pretty much margin dilutive. So how do you ensure that you are giving them a very, very strong sense of validation that this was the right decision? This episode is sponsored by Fullcast, the company that helps operators build better sales territories. Their platform focuses the right sellers on the right opportunities, making them unstoppable. And the cherry on top? Fullcast automates common go-to-market activities like territory rebalancing, account hierarchies, routing, and more, so the plan is always in sync with operations. With Fullcast, say goodbye to -to go-to-market planning headaches and hello to your own personal planning assistant. Learn more about Fullcast today by visiting fullcast.io. Okay, back to Sean. Before the break, we spent most of our conversation talking about the decision to expand internationally and the people aspect of making that expansion successful. I want to turn now to actually running the business of this international office. Countless decisions about org structures, goals, internal reporting, all of a sudden get a little bit more complicated. Let's start with org structure. Where should an international office sit in the company? How should reporting be set up? Like any good operator, Shantanu told me, it depends. I think there's really, there's two worlds and there's, there's no right formula. I can, I can again share what we've done at Gong, what I've seen at LinkedIn and a couple of others as well. But I would say there's the entire decentralized model where you pretty much help, uh, like I mentioned, set up a GM who then has pretty much almost every function reporting into them. Or you can have a more centralized functional uh, role where regions report into certain functions and then all the functions bubble up in the, in the center. 
So what I've seen work well, and maybe it's to do with even maturity of both companies. I think when you are setting up international, you need to give the person you've identified as your point person in the region, whether that's someone who's come in from the US or you've identified locally from, from the region, in this case, let's say in, in Dublin, you ideally want them to have a centralized almost scope over the, over the team. Like here in, in, in Gong Dublin, we have sales teams, we have engineering, like literally the team which is coding and building a product. We have customer success, we have sales, we have operations, we have marketing. Um, we have obviously within the sales team, we have SDRs, solutions engineers, sales engineers and the like. So technically the way we set up was our GM had, let's say half of those functions reporting directly into them. But the others, for all events and purposes, had a dotted line into them. Got it. And, and what that helped is really drive speed of execution and move, move things forward. If I think about the way we even do, we're in August, I can't believe we're at the end of August, but we're soon going to be in, in planning mode. When you think about the overall resources going in for the region, when you wear the GM hat, you look at that entire picture and then go from there. Mm-hmm. Now, if you step forward a few more years for a company like LinkedIn, which has been over 10 years in the international space, you start thinking more functionally. So your sales team might roll up under the global VP of sales sitting in, in the US. You have, let's say, an EMEA head, marketing plans in a different, I don't want to say silo, I don't like that word at all, but let's say in a different process. And most lines get crossed and dotted at the top globally, mm-hmm. while regions pretty much talk to each other. And from a reporting structure, I think that works a little bit more so we are more um, we're able to work in a lot more streamlined fashion where you pretty much think global but act local in that big company uh, picture. But I think when, you, when you're really in those early phases of just having landed in a region, you do need to almost think, think local and act local for a while while you're, while, you're, while you're taking a balance. Again, if I think about my priorities, probably 50% of my priorities are coming in from the global priorities and 50% mm-hmm. are literally what we're trying to incubate and build for the region. Can you talk a little bit more about how those priorities come to be? Like if, if you have that 50-50 split, mm-hmm. you know, we can take, you know, your, you know, ops function as the mm-hmm. example. Like where, where do you turn to, to kind of make sure that you are finding the right balance in that split between local and global? That's a good point, John. So I think the, the way I think about that and, Maybe it's the way I approach pretty much planning and, and I'm not talking about the annual, but let's say your, your quarterly priority, let's start there, right? quarterly priorities, annual priorities, and then you drill it, down, drill it down to weekly. To me, the first almost starting point or true north for any company has to be the company vision goals that comes from there. Ideally, you have a very clear set. And at, at, at Gong, for instance, we know what are three priorities. Um, interestingly for us, in fact, last year, international was one of the three global priorities, which really helped in a different way. And again, I would, I would definitely recommend that for any company just having landed some sort of international as a priority at some point, because mm. so long as folks other than the CEO are thinking about international, it's easier to really drive that forward. Uh, but having thrown that red herring at you, I'll go back to, uh, so three priorities that we have, let's say at a global level, you start drilling that down. And if I think about purely from an ops from an ops perspective, our ops function has a few global priorities, deliverables, pieces we're working on. There are a lot of those projects where I would consider myself a part of that global team. And my team here in EMEA would work on some of those pieces as well. But let's say we almost budget for time in a way where that's a certain percentage of our time. The remaining 50%, and this is really where international can help companies scale and, and drive forward. We spend time trying to think, figure out, okay, if, if our biggest challenges right now are X, Y, Z on the go-to-market piece, ABC on how do we think about the product market fit and Z on longer term growth, what can we start doing or what do we see as areas of opportunities within region, right? And again, one example I've seen in several companies come come very strong. In fact, HubSpot was one of them. LinkedIn is another one, is the channel or even the reseller and distributor channel sales portion is a lot stronger outside of the US, especially in, yeah. in Europe. If, if you want to be a big tech company at, at scale, you have to crack the code for how to sell via the channel. And you might have been a massive multi-billion dollar company in the US, 
without having used the channel. So just and this is an example of this, how do you start incubating those priorities? So for instance, one of the priorities I've had someone in my team working on is trying to understand that part of the business and working then with the global head of channel to ensure that we are trying to really incubate some things which we can we can see as opportunities now from from a regional lens at some point they might have global impact but we see right now in, in the shorter term real glo- regional impact from those priorities you can totally see how what starts as an in region local priority could very quickly transform into an initiative that has global impact and i think that's where shantanu's advice of carving out 50% of your goals just for in region priorities is so important if you don't consciously make that effort It could be very easy to be overrun by the priorities from HQ. And what's more, if you as a company have made such an investment to put people in region, why bother doing that if you're not going to leverage that local presence to find those unique local priorities? How you treat an international office differently doesn't stop there, though. Shantanu and I also talked about some of the short-term financial health trade-offs you might need to be comfortable with when deciding to expand internationally. When you think about planning, and, and, and if I think about most tech companies tend to think about planning as, as shorter sprints of one-year planning cycles and literally um, spend a lot, of, a lot of cycles on what's the broader financial plan. There's probably different players involved, right, from the C-suite to finance, the FP&A head, the operations teams, and obviously all the go-to-market heads and, and, and product heads. Now, the, the part where international will always struggle is if the moment you think about a short-term plan, if you've just landed in, and, and created a new international market, as you think about next year, it will not look very, very attractive. <laughs> It'll always look like a small drop in the ocean coming through. And you're like, why am I putting all these resources in here again? So the, the part I've seen succeed in, and both here as well as at, at, at LinkedIn was you start talking about the hockey stick, right? You talk about you're literally going to be investing X amount of dollars the first 12 months, maybe even 24 months. You'll actually not be adding as many margin dollars as you'd want. But this is what this could look like three years from now, four years from now, five years from now. And I think it's, it's having a very clear vision or picture of what that potential looks like, but not just painting the picture, but getting very concrete steps to get there. I think that's crucial. And what I mean by that is, let's say, you, and, I, and I keep using the 10% and 30% number. Yeah, let's say you but say, that's a good North Star. That's a, it's like you say, this is 10%. I want to get a 30%. This is the amount of time I believe I'll get a 30%. And again, to your point, Sean, the reason I talk about 30% of North Star is most tech companies, I think, let's say Dropbox, about 35%. Slack was, before it got acquired by Salesforce, about the same, time, same percent. Uh, HubSpot, about 30, in fact, even more than that now, 35% is only EMEA. I think they're almost 50% internationally. So a lot of these companies have been really getting there. And you, you have all these examples of companies who have landed, say, 10, 15, 20 years ago in Europe and really gotten there from an, just from an EMEA and international perspective. So if you start creating that goal and saying, this is my vision, but have a very clear picture of this is how I will get there. These are the choices I want us to make as a company. And this is what I need from you in order to get there. That's how I think the plan needs to come in. And then it, it probably takes a few, few, few cycles. I've been in a couple of those uh, previously where you, where you have to educate, uh, not just from a financial standpoint, but what it means from a, from a very tactical operational lens, because there's the broader number. But to get there, let's say today you, you had five heads in the US and you approve five heads in Europe. The five heads in the US, let's say you, you hire in time X. In Europe, it might take you twice as much or even thrice as much, depending on the market you're hiring in. So how do you prepare for that? How do you start creating that piece, uh, that piece of almost um, weightage or expectation when, when you'll actually hire people? Similarly, from a productivity perspective. So a lot of questions there. Yeah, I was just going to add that exact point. Like, and once they get in the door, like they will not be as productive as, as their U.S. counterparts, right, for a while. And, and like... I I think that that longer term lens is important for people. And it sounds like from what I'm gathering from what you're saying, like it's probably three years, right? You probably need to be comfortable with things not being perfect, not being great. And like, there's going to be obviously improvements that happen from year one to year two to year three. But like, is that right? Am I, is three years like about every business is different, but about three years. And that's fair. And I think, and, and again, it depends how you measure success is what I think agree, Sean, sure. which is, let's say in three years, you're probably going to be at that scale in your international markets where you're, 
you're able to be at a similar margin profile. Again, there'll always be that a bit of a gap where US will be a few years ahead. Um, but I, I do like the fact in three years, and if you're measuring, I always think about inputs and outputs. If you're measuring outputs in terms of revenue, in terms of, we talk about productivity, it takes some time to get there. I would also measure inputs in terms of, are you getting just as much pipeline built? Are you getting just as much activity from a sales perspective? Are you getting as many marketing leads? Are you seeing a similar uh, customer delight score, whatever you're using there? I think the moment you look at those inputs, I think that you should see, even in the first year, getting to the level you need to be. The reason why you'll always have this gulf between input and output, and I think three years is a fair number for the first three years, is there are table stakes challenges which the team will have. And what I mean by those table stakes challenges are the product will not translate the same, even in English, in, in the UK versus the US. The, pro the product will not be truly international. Second, even in terms of regulations, you'll come up against new things which you would have never thought about in, in, in the US. Third, from a very operational lens, I keep, think, I keep thinking about FX rates and selling in different currencies all the time. The, you will start hitting those customers who are like, we love your product, but hey, I will only buy in euros or pounds or whatever, insert currency here. So that's a challenge which they will always have, bridging the gap between inputs and outputs. But I would say in the first year, once you've set the, the, the team and set the right cadence, you start seeing... I would say the team tracking well to inputs, outputs. I think you'll take it'll take about two to three years, right? I'm so glad you mentioned all those examples of the things that just like you people wouldn't necessarily think about or not anticipate, and then just like it requires work, right? And it mm -hmm. requires additional thought and systems to 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 handle and facilitate. And I think the other thing about the timeline, we've talked a lot about the business side of it, but there's you know, there's a human part of this too, especially yes. if you're going to, you know, uproot people, their families and move them over to a different country. Also hiring people locally who are joining something that's relatively untested, like having that kind of, you know, you mentioned earlier it, when HQ considers that international expansion to be a priority, like I think that's an awesome starting point, but then also committing to it for a certain period of time so that the people who are signing up for this thing that will be hard and will be rocky, at least know in the back of their head, like, hey, I've got this commitment that we're going to try this for a while. Um, and I'm not, you know, going to be sitting here in six months, all of a sudden, like with my two small children that I've moved from, yes. from the United States, like out of work and no office. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And again, and what you just mentioned, about, uh, I think the it is a very, very, I would say, strong personal commitment for literally everyone. And you're right, because, um, and, and that's why I think the mindset is so important, because by the time a company is opened in an office in, in Europe or elsewhere, they're probably at a, at a scale up in, or size of a scale up by then. The challenge is the moment you're starting up again, you're starting off with a startup right there. So it is back to what you just said, the, the, the actual motivations, the question marks, they're all pretty much where the company might have been five, six years ahead. So very, I love that point. Before we go, at the end of each show, we're going to ask each guest the same lightning round of questions. Ready? Here we go. Best book you've read in the last six months? Uh, I'd say Never Split the, uh, Never Split the Difference. Um, I think, I'm sure it's a very, very, very famous book in sales circles, especially uh, I, was, I was trying to learn a little bit more negotiation myself and I'm Floored. Loved it. It's a great way uh, for an operator to be uh, endeared by uh, his sales peers, uh, for <laughs> sure. I would imagine uh, they must love you. That is exactly uh, why I had to learn it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, favorite part about working in ops? I think the, the problem solving aspect. I just love finding something which is difficult to crack and spending some time figuring it out. In fact, um, one phrase I'd heard was, I love running towards fire. Mm. So, nah, not that. Flip side, least favorite part about working in ops? Sometimes the problems are very, <laughs> very thorny. It's, it's crazy. It's the same thing which I, I would say is the, my favorite part because um, there are things that you just can't solve sometimes and then you have, to, you have to probably make do with an almost solution sometimes. And again, that's probably the part which I sometimes struggle with. Someone who helped you get to the job you have today? Great question. Uh, I think the job I have to, there's someone I must thank, uh, there quite a few people who I must thank. Everybody really has been really crucial in this, but one person I look on as a mentor and has been very, very helpful in navigating through these challenges is um, 
Olivier Sabella. He is the head of LinkedIn sales in EMEA right now, actually. And he was one of my business partners when I started out in Dublin. So really loved, uh, learned a lot from him. And yeah, uh, I'd say he definitely helped me get here. That's awesome. All right, last one. Uh, one piece of advice for people who want to have your job someday. I think especially in ops, I talked about loving problem solving myself a lot, but I think the core difference between someone who is good at ops and someone who's great at ops is how you're able to communicate because 20% of the, of the work is actually solving problems. The remaining 80% is communicating and driving change. And I'd say someone who's already in ops or trying to figure out, I just say spend some more time on the software aspects because again, people like me don't think that's, that's quite run of the mill will happen on its own, but you tend, you need to put a lot more cycles in there. Thanks so much to Sean Tanir for joining us on this week's episode of Operations. If you liked what you heard, make sure you are subscribed to our show to get a new episode in your feed every other Friday. Also, if you'd prefer a video version of the show, make sure you check out our YouTube channel operations with Sean Lane. You can subscribe there as well. If you learned something today from Sean's new or from any of our guests in the past, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts, six star reviews only. All right. That's going to do it for me. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you next time. Today's episode is sponsored by Fullcast, your go-to-market planning platform. If you've ever spent hours or days building territory and quota plans only to have them be out of date the second the reps hit the street, you need to check out Fullcast. With Fullcast, you set intelligent rule-based policies that automate all of the time-consuming manual tasks that hit RevOps teams throughout the year. With virtually no effort, operations will always seamlessly align with your plan. Learn more about Fullcast today by visiting fullcast.io.